Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. No Good Deed, book one of the Mark Taylor psychological thriller series by M.P. McDonald, is free on Amazon.com. Seeing the future comes at a price. What price would you be willing to pay to save thousands of lives? Mark Taylor knows his actions scream guilty, but he was only trying to stop the horrible terrorist attack. Instead of a thank you, the government labels him an enemy combatant and throws him in the brig with no rights, no trial, and no way to prove his innocence. He learns firsthand that the CIA can do anything they want to him, anything at all. Mark's just a regular guy, a photographer, who finds himself in an extraordinary situation when an antique camera he buys at a dusty Afghanistan bazaar produces photographs of future tragedies, tragedies he's driven to prevent. His frantic warnings about September 11th are ignored, but put him in the government crosshairs when he learns what being labeled an enemy combatant really means. Download this intense and gripping thriller now, free on Amazon. No Good Deed, book one of the Mark Taylor psychological thriller series by M.P. McDonald. As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, book one by Risa Walker and Caleb Ansel. From Risa Walker, the award-winning author of the best-selling Kronos Files, and debut author Caleb Amsel comes a chilling story of altered reality and psychological terror. Chase Ray sits perfectly still, his thumbs traveling across the screen of the broken computer tablet, stuck in the nexus between two worlds. Haddon Wood isn't real. It can't be. Another world, another reality, hovers just beyond his reach. He can see it sometimes. He can almost touch it. In that world, things are in balance. The dead stay dead and the creature feature remains safely on the screen. That world isn't a patchwork quilt of every scary book or movie he's seen. In that world, the nightmares generally end when you open your eyes and people don't glitch in and out of existence. Chase is determined to return to that world, although he's a bit worried that the only way out is through the noose that seems to lurk around every corner. He needs allies to get back home. But how do you choose your team when you can't tell who's real? As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, Book One by Risa Walker and Caleb Amsel. We're so happy to have our friend Crystal Pico Watanabe as a sponsor of the show. Crystal is one of the best editors in the business, and she has just debuted a new service that I think you'll absolutely love and will help you to up your writing game. Pico's School of Wordcraft and Editing has just debuted, and the first course is called Properly Punctuating Dialogue. It's a mini course and can be completed in just about 20 minutes. It covers the basics of dialogue punctuation. Authors can get access to the new school and the course for free by signing up for Crystal's author newsletter, Notes from Pico. Go to picoshouse.com slash newsletters. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com slash newsletters. More in-depth courses will be added in 2020. Make sure you don't miss a thing. Picoshouse.com slash newsletters. Unwilling Souls by Gregory D. Little. Books 1 and 2 are only 99 cents for a limited time. The gods are rightfully imprisoned, and Cess intends to keep them that way. But her terrorist father has other plans. Gregory D. Little's Unwilling Souls is a pulse-pounding chase through an epic fantasy world of adventure, sinister conspiracy, and a magical industrial revolution fueled by harvested human souls. Cess is the daughter of powerful parents who would very much like to kill one another and who therefore pretend she doesn't exist. An apprentice jailer of the gods, Cess spends her days learning to forge the tools needed to maintain the gods' prison. When her terrorist father attacks the prison on her 16th birthday, 
Cess is forced to flee after the secret of her parentage is revealed. Suddenly on the wrong side of the law, Cess realizes the very father who abandoned her may be the only one who can protect her. But some secrets are darker than parentage. On her way to find her father, Cess will uncover truths about her family and herself that will shatter her understanding of the world and risk the return of the gods themselves. Unwilling Souls and its sequel, Ungrateful God, are on sale now for only 99 cents. The third book of the series is coming early next year, so now is the perfect time to get up to speed. Unwilling Souls by Gregory D. Little. Books 1 and 2, only 99 cents for a limited time. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. Before we get into our fantastic interview with John L. Monk, we're going to play an audiobook excerpt from his book, Mythian. When uh, you listen to this audiobook excerpt, some things we talk about in the show will make a little more sense. Plus, it's really enjoyable. Take a few minutes, check out this audiobook clip, and then we're going to get in to our talk with John Monk. That morning in the common room, the tables were filled with homely people eating bread and drinking ale. Bernard stood behind the bar, telling several people the history of Heroes Landing in a hushed tone. It was as if nothing had changed from the day before. A weird sort of claustrophobia closed in on me, one where I stared down the eons at a life where nothing changed and nothing anyone did mattered in the slightest. I moved closer to listen. The barkeep's animated face matched his relentless cadence, alternating between that of a professional storyteller and the worst sort of hard-sell huckster. Lo, Bernard intoned, it was here those magical beings left their legacy, beneath the very bones of Heroes Landing. For a single gold piece, I can sell you an ancient map showing the entrance to those forgotten passages beneath this modern city. I also have swords, spellbooks, prayerbooks, totems, effigies, lockpicks, ranger quivers, and most of the other class starters. No haggling! Now, let's see, who's first? Angry grumbling from the group. Then one of them, a skinny man of Asian descent, said, Some crazy bitch killed us and stole our starter gold. Totally not fair. I'd like to file a complaint. Bernard's smile was wide, and his eyes gleamed evilly. And where, pray tell, will you file such a complaint? Customer support? There is none. Tech support? You're looking at it. If you need gold, go out and beg for it. Someone will eventually give it to you. Or you could always find a god and pray to it, see what happens. Some sects hand out prayer books free. If you like fighting, monks rely on punches and kicks, devastating DPS at high levels. Wouldn't that be fun? You could even multi-class. Diversity in skills. That's where the real survivability lies. Uh, excuse me, I said loudly, then swallowed when ten pairs of eyes turned to regard me. What's a DPS? Several in the crowd snorted. One of them muttered, They call us noobs. Ethan, Bernard boomed. So good of you to join us. I was just telling these noobs, noobs, noobs about this glorious city. He pointed rudely at everyone there as he said this. Oh, and to answer your question, DPS stands for damage per second. It's an old term from way back when, but it doesn't really apply anymore. Your kind still says it, though. One of the snorters, a woman, and the mutterer, a man, left the inn in a huff, still snorting and muttering to themselves. It sounded as if they were going to try begging. The other retirees began arguing about what to do. Someone suggested ganging up on noobs entering the game, the way Magda had done to us, thus perpetuating the abuse. I'd had enough. Excuse me, I said again. When nobody noticed, I raised my voice. Excuse me! That got their attention. I held up a shiny gold piece, the one returned to me by Magda. It had the Everlife logo on one side and a dragon's head on the other. I'll buy the map and share whatever's in it, I said. Well done, Ethan, Bernard said. Here you go. The gold piece disappeared from my hand and a game notification flashed across my field of vision. Undertown, added to maps. I checked the tab in my character sheet called Maps and saw a new entry, Map to Undertown. Another game message, Virtue Bonus, plus five, Charity to Strangers. I disabled the audible notifications but forgot about those pesky virtue updates. 
Stifling a curse, I disabled them with a thought. After that, I endured handshakes and back-clapping from players asking how much gold I had, and could they have some too. Bernard just grinned. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have my friend John L. Monk on the show with me. He has a fantastic new book out uh, that uh, is the first book in a series, and the other two are coming in quick succession. Uh, the first book is called Mythian. It's, uh, it's the first book. In a brand new lit RPG and a game lit fantasy series. Uh, John, I love it. And we've been friends for quite a while and I'm f- glad to finally have you on the show. Welcome. Hey, welcome. It's wonderful to talk to you. Uh, I'm just so happy to be here. This is the place to be if you're an author and readers, actually, if you uh, ask me. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, we were talking about Mythian and, and folks listening to the show just got a taste of the audio. Uh, of this fantastic book. Um, and we've got so much to talk about, but before we do, before we get into really breaking down what people just heard, everybody knows we begin the show with the same question each time. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I guess the first time I wanted to be a, uh, a professional writer, somebody who got paid, I was probably in junior high <laughs> and I, I loved reading all the way up uh, until that. And then I think I bought the the writer's market and I was like, oh, my goodness, you can get paid for this. Uh, I don't know what I thought. You know, kids are kids are silly that way. But um, that just made it that much more uh, amazing. So I was writing like crazy and submitting to places. And I got some nice little letters back and everything. Um, and I think it was in college that I sat down and tried to write my first novel. Um, and I wrote a bunch of starter novels, I guess, and I never finished anything. And I'm sure every other writer out there has experienced that. Um, but when I turned 40, I said, you know, I'm about due for my midlife, midlife crisis. So I'm just going to go ahead and finish a novel. And that novel was kick. Uh, and I was pretty happy with it. Um, and, uh, the rest is history. <laughs> well, you know, I think every writer out there with a desk has a desk drawer with, uh, you know, that's full of, uh, either completed novels that, that aren't any good or they don't think are any good or, you know, half finished novels. So, uh, I, I think everyone can relate, uh, with what you're talking about there, uh, being in middle school and then getting a copy of the writer's market, that's pretty intense for a, for a junior high, uh, kid uh, you don't hear that story very often. I have a lot of stories you're not going to hear very often <laughs> in junior high school, but this isn't that kind of show. Uh, no, I didn't have a lot of friends. Uh, I think it was, um, you know, I think it was the the fact that I couldn't afford like the really cool sneakers and, uh, you know, nice you know, fashionable clothing, uh, whatever. Um, if you ever want your kid to grow up and go to college, don't let them uh, wear fashionable clothing because they'll get too many friends and, or maybe they'll go to college and just not do very well. I don't know. <laughs> I did pretty well in college. That's great. What did you study in college? Uh, anthropology. Yeah. But as one does, um, that <laughs> it had uh, how does anthropology dovetail with uh, your love of writing and desire to be a writer? Well, I mean, you get to experience so many different cultures and ways of thinking. Uh, you know, you you learn about lots of uh, cultural history. Um, and you know, you get an insight into why th- people do things and, and you, and you start learning that, uh, people do things pretty much for the same reasons. You know, like they, they, the verbs are all the same, but the nouns are different as I like to think of it. So, uh, it's basically just, um, just exposure to a lot of different cultures and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would think that that would be very beneficial, uh, for a writer, uh, even if you don't think about it that way in the beginning, um, the, the experience and the, the insight, um, I mean, those are things that writers can always use. Well, yeah, I mean, I remember I was, uh, it's also just the experiences. Um, you know, they say go to college for the experience, but, um, in my case, the experience was going to Malta and studying like, uh, Maltese boat makers and, uh, getting, you know, if you want to be a writer, uh, this, it's going to sound kind of funny. As much as I like getting a degree in anthropology, I almost wish I didn't go to college and I wish I had traveled because I got my best education when I went to Malta and I was like assaulted by a bus driver, like, you know, kicking me because I was doing a cultural faux pas 
which is uh, pointing your foot at someone else. Uh, you know, because I'm a big guy. I'm actually six five, and Maltese uh, buses are like the, they should put them in circuses. Okay, they're that tiny. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, as far as the seats are concerned, so I had to kind of scrunch up on the seat, and I was pointing my foot at this lady. Uh, I I knew exactly what happened as soon as the guy started kicking me, um, and told me not to. You know, I realized because I learned. You know, somewhere along the way, on the, along the way, that you don't show your feet, or indicate to other people with your feet or something. Uh, the foot wasn't on the on the seat or anything, so he wasn't protecting the seat. It was just sort of across my ankle, kind of pointing at her, and she was looking at my foot really angrily when he did it. And uh, so, and that all that always stuck with me, uh, just how incredibly out of a fish out of water you are um, when, you know, when you're not in your house or in your neighborhood. <laughs> and so I wish I'd spent way more time as a writer kind of walking the earth like Cain from Kung Fu, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. Oh, if we could only explain that to our parents beforehand to <laughs> just, uh, yeah. yeah. Mom, I want to walk the earth. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, I'm assuming you were a pretty bookish kid. Um, what what kinds of things did you like to read? And do you remember the book or series or author that really kind of cracked your head open and just lit your imagination on fire? It's amazing that you tell, uh, you mentioned that. So I was in fifth grade, I believe, and um, I was standing in front of my house. Uh, we had these townhouses, which uh, I actually figure in my Jenkins Cycle books. Uh you know, from my old neighborhood. I think we always write about our old neighborhood. I was staying there with my best friend, Rich. And Rich was telling me about this strange thing that he did, which I found unbelievable. He'd read a book, okay? And he, not just any book. If he read Ursula Le Guin's uh, A Wizard of Earthsea. Oh, yeah. And he's telling me about the book. And this, I can't probably can't do it this way. I probably can't enjoy a book this way ever again, having read. But... um. He's telling me all the things that happened in the book, like massive spoilers, like from page one to the end, this thing about true names and how if you know someone's true name, you can control them and do things, you know, and, uh, and, and the island of Roke, I believe that was the name with the wind, the Roke wind that spins up all around him and how he has to go, you know, I don't know, I'm not going to spoil it. But anyway, he's spoiling it for me <laughs> and I'm enjoying this so much. And so I went to I went to school and I I looked up the Wizard of Earthsea and I got it and uh, I read it and it blew my mind uh, and I couldn't believe that I could ever enjoy a book because you know I'm in fifth grade I'm a boy you know all the girls are reading books the books they are reading look like just the worst kind of crap that anybody would ever see uh, you know I don't want to read romance or whatever you know um, so there it was and. Um, and that inspired me, and I picked up. Now, although that inspired me, it inspired me to read more books, but it didn't inspire me to write. What inspired me to write was Terry Brooks, and uh, he's going to feature heavily in this podcast, actually. Terry Brooks wrote uh, A Wish Song of Shannara, which I actually picked up. I picked up a copy with no cover. Okay, I was that bored. I was in detention, and it was in junior high again. It was in seventh grade in, uh, in America. That's when. That's when they start us. Um, and I picked it up. It was over against the window. You were allowed to read. You couldn't, you know, we didn't have iPhones. But you get the idea. We couldn't do anything. So I picked it up. I'm like, I'm not going to read this thing. It doesn't even have a cover. You know, so I started reading it. And I was like floored. And it's book three in his Shannara series, too, right. by the way. Right. So I'm reading it. And I'm. he did a good job, uh, you know, of uh, what do you call it? Of, of, of sort of like letting people join the series late. Yeah. And I blew through that. And that's when I wrote, uh, wrote a copycat story, changing all the names, my own horrible prose. And I turned that in as an assignment and I got a really good grade on it. Um, you know, it was all my prose though. It was, I, I think I chose the name Garrett Jacks because he's just that badass, <laughs> you know, yeah. but he, and here's where he comes in, uh, into the, into the, uh, into the story a little bit more. Um, you had him on a, uh, one of your shows recently. I did. Well, it was a couple and, of years ago. Oh, well, for me, it was recently. I'll think about it that way. And, um, he inspired me to do something which I've been inspired for to do. And I didn't do, which is to outline. And so 
he kind of inspired me in outline. And he also uh, led drop that he wrote a book on writing. So I read his book on writing, hoping to get more information on outlining. And I was super gung ho to outline. And so I started outlining and I just gave up because I can't outline. I mean, I do many outlines like, okay, what's this chapter going to be like? Or, or where do I want the overall story to go? Okay. The overall story is maybe he dies in the end, which isn't going to happen in any of my books. Sorry, <laughs> but you get it. That's the overarching thing. And like, I want these kind of three acts to go like this, but I can't get down to the nitty gritty uh, into the little weeds. And I thought maybe I could, and I couldn't. But what I got out of his book, uh, and you got to pick up his book if you're an author and you're listening to this, this it's called Sometimes the Magic Works. Fantastic um, book. It is. And what I really got out of it was, you know, here I am sitting there with writer's block, okay? Uh, and everybody talks about writer's block, how there's no such thing. And, you know, starving artists uh, are, you know, if you got to pay a mortgage, you don't get writer, writer's block. And that's all probably true, but I have a job, so... <laughs> and the way he got me out of it was this concept of his called fantas, uh, fantasization. I can't say it. <laughs> uh, anyway, so fantasizing about the, uh, about the work that you're doing, meaning you're thinking you're not sitting down to write. You're walking somewhere or driving down the road and you're thinking about your characters. You're thinking just like what their day is like almost. You're just thinking maybe what, what they're wearing or, or maybe something about the world. And you're just thinking about it, not with a point in mind or with an agenda, but as entertainment. You're just thinking about it like you'd think about a movie that you just saw, maybe how you would handle things differently, you know, if you were in that movie, you know. So, and that blew up. My mind hit a different wavelength. I could not stop writing. I couldn't get to sleep at night. Uh, I was up really early. I was always writing and I couldn't get it out fast enough. It was so amazing. So just, just try that. Try thinking about your story without an agenda. Um, and by the way, if you can't enjoy your story without an agenda, then you're going to be in trouble. You know, you gotta, you gotta like your story, obviously. Absolutely. Um, one thing that I love about your books and, um, <clears throat> kick the Jenkins cycle, the, the first book in the Jenkins cycle. I absolutely love, um, I, I guess that was probably the, the first book of yours, uh, that I read. And, um, I find it really interesting that that's the book that you sat down to, uh, you know, kind of challenge yourself that, you know, this is the, I'm, I'm going to do this thing. And this is the book that came out of that. Um, one thing that I really love about your writing and it holds out in your new series just like it did in the Jenkins cycle is that you are not afraid to take us on an emotional journey um and uh very um i'm trying to put this into words uh to to effectively communicate what i mean um you are not afraid to put us through the emotional ringer um you know with the uh, you know difficult things that are, that the characters are going through, but then you also are not afraid to play with levity and to add some humor in there and to, to really take us on the, the gamut of human emotion. Um, is that something that you think about uh, is, you know, have you been observant of other people's writing and, you know, made a conscious decision that, you know, I really want these characters to be human and to do that. They really need to convey, you know, the full gamut. Uh, is that something that goes into your process at all? Wow. It's really nice when you put it that way. <laughs> I kind of want to hear more. <laughs> so thank you. Um, You're welcome. Yeah. Well, uh, let me think. Um, one thing I like to do whenever I sit down to write is I like to take a situation and then just sort of dive into the situation. You know, you know, I just sort of, I like to make it really big, okay? Like a small situation, like just walking into a house, you know, and uh, looking around and then going upstairs. I say, okay, well, that's that's pretty simple. That only took maybe two sentences. He walks in the house, he goes upstairs. But there's so much more that's going on when you walk in a house and go upstairs. It's a house that's not familiar to you, right? It's in a neighborhood that's not familiar to you. You know, you're you're there against maybe the homeowner's wishes. So you're going to be really quiet 
And how can you be quiet with that noisy front door that creaks open? And, you know, you step into the house and it's got these smells. Uh, maybe they don't open the windows enough. Maybe they smoke, you know, maybe there's uh, uh, other things going on in the house, like dead bodies somewhere. And all these things are happening to you one second, happening to the, to the main character, one second after another. And you're going to experience these things linearly, but it's also going to be, it's going to feel like it's immediate. And as you go through the house, more sensations happen. So you've got all these things going on and then the fear creeps in. And then what you have to do, at least what I like to do, is just when you've got them right on the edge of like losing their minds, something ridiculous happens. You know, something silly uh, or shocking. You know, I like to usually follow shocking, uh, silly with shocking and and uh, creepy with silly, you know. So, but obviously I try to shake that up because otherwise people catch on. So, <laughs> so yeah, I just stretch out, uh, I stretch out tiny things make them big and uh then you can kind of really explore the emotions that you know that's going on well and and you also take very big ideas and bring them down to an accessible level i mean look look, look at the premise of the jenkins cycle i mean he lives forever three weeks at a time um what was the what was the kind of the beginning idea for that uh book and that series well, first of all, oh, by the way, I want to say that I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not used to having other authors read me. Uh, I usually, <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm overly flattered that you read my books. I actually didn't know that you'd read any of them. So I'm like, uh, it's like finding out that like somebody you idolize is like kind of into you. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would never have a guest on that I was not prepared for. That's uh, that's that's just rude. Yeah. Okay. But, well, thanks. but but I I read Kick long before you know you came on the show, so don't don't uh, don't don't think I'm dis, dis, di, diminishing that. I'm sorry. No, I appreciate I appreciate yeah. it. So how did I get the idea? I think that's yeah. basically the question. Yeah, just kind of like and and did this begin as a fully formed idea? You know, a lot of times it's a maybe a, a what if question and, and things start growing from there. How did this one begin? It probably began when I was uh, nine years old and I realized that I was going to die and there would be nothing left. And I remember sitting there on the, on the stairs, just bawling my eyes out. And my mom asked me, why are you doing that? <laughs> the futility like, of life, mom. <laughs> I figured I was going to die <laughs> and that there would be nothing left. It would be not because we weren't a religious family. I mean, I mean, my parents believed in God, but we didn't kind of go to church and we didn't preach it and we didn't say prayers with, before anything or after anything. Um, so anyway, here I am growing up afraid of death. And I decided when I turned 40 that I was going to basically invent my own afterlife uh, for a guy who who even in a, even though he's going to live forever and he knows that the supernatural exists, he doesn't know uh the nature of God, or as he calls it, the great whomever. Uh, he just, you know, so here he is, and he gets to decide, you know, whether he's going to be evil or he's going to be good. He's living forever. So the, this this idea of of constructing your own um, afterlife cosmology kind of kicked off that that uh, thought process. It did, but there was also. Um, there was also like, uh, you know, the show Dexter was on at the time. And so there's uh, whatever I'm watching on TV tends to kind of find its way into my books. So I remember really liking Dexter. You have this sort of quirky character. Uh, you know, he's shockingly violent, but he could be funny and charming. And so I, I admired that. And uh, although it's not a, you know, there's no analog between Dan Jenkins, which is the main character, and, you know, Dexter. Um they're definitely inspired, but you know, it's all me. It's, uh, it's different facets of my personality shoved into a guy who kills a lot of people over the course of three books. Um, but they're all bad people. Yeah. That's kind of like Dexter. I mean, Dexter kills bad people. Yeah. And it's kind of fun to, to explore the things that we'd never get to do in real life. Yeah. So that was, that's kind of what I do, you know, in all my books. Uh, there's another uh, book I wrote called uh, 
Thief's Odyssey. And that had nothing to do with, uh, well, life or death in the most uh, shocking kind of way. It was sort of my desire to be a cat burglar. You know, I've always loved stories about burglars and thieves and uh, criminals, you know, not just the kind where they go around killing people. Uh, actually, I, I tend to find serial killers and slashers and, and any kind of like overly violent things. I'm sort of turned off by it. Uh, there's nothing more interesting to me than somebody who's like trying to break into a bank and get away without even being detected. So. And uh, the Jenkins cycle went for three books. Uh, how did you, when you first wrote Kick, did you did you see this as a trilogy, or at the end of that book there was just more story to tell? It's funny that you mentioned that. So that was a part of my author career, or, or sort of uh, me going up the ladder and learning as I go. Book one was supposed to be, I wrote a book, okay? It's like, hey, I wrote a book. I did what I said I was going to do with my life. And then I was like, I put it out there, and it sold a little bit. You know, I didn't know anything about marketing. Uh, I didn't realize at the time, but the way I had launched it, it sold much better than it probably should have. You know, like a couple of hundred books in the first month. Uh, and I was thinking, of course, going into this, as soon as I hit publish, <laughs> you know, being a self-published author, that uh, I was just going to be like on all the television shows and they're just going <laughs> to, they're going to love me and everybody's going to be talking about the book and sharing it with their friends and it's just going to explode. And so it didn't happen. Uh, and I thought that my success was not successful. I thought that was really terrible. So I started like learning. I started listening to the rocking self-publishing podcast with uh, Simon Whistler. He no longer, he no longer does those, but he's got some amazing YouTube, uh, channels. Uh, look up biographics. If you get a chance. Yeah. He was, he was actually a guest on, on this show, uh, early in, uh, I think he was around episode 30 something, if I remember right. Yeah. Well, he's an amazing guy. He's yeah. A fun guy. Class act. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I started, I started learning from him, uh, rather the people he'd have on, uh, I just, I just ate them up and, uh, I couldn't get enough. And I started listening to other podcasts and, uh, you know, reading a lot more about how to actually make money and be a successful author. Uh, and uh, I didn't really get my craft information from those types of things. I, I tend to just sort of like, I think I'm a know it all with that, when, where that's concerned. And I follow my own muse. But the marketing side, uh, I've learned a lot. And uh, and I, anyway, I learned that I had to write two more books. Uh, I learned, and that's okay. I had those two books in me. They just had to, they had to have a reason to come out. So, uh, you know, it's like uh, everybody likes to read a series. I know I like reading series. So I wrote a series and uh, it's actually, uh, it's actually been pretty fun. And, uh, you know, at times it has been profitable, you know, whenever I do, um, what do you call it, uh, Whenever do promotions, um, and another thing that's happened is uh, uh, one of my books. Uh, I'm not going to say which one, but of all of my books out there, one of them has been optioned for a television show. Wow! Um, is it, you obviously can't can't talk much about it, but that that has to be that that's a whole different feeling. You know, there's there's um, and and it's kind of weird that that in the culture that we live in, uh, well, especially since we're in this kind of golden age of, of great television right now. Um, th that's a different kind of um, acknowledgement of your work, I guess we should say. That that had to be a great feeling when that happened. Uh, yeah, it's. I actually still haven't gotten over it. I mean, just the option alone is, uh, I don't think it's ever going to happen, guys. <laughs> you know, I, you read all these things about Hollywood, and I mean, you know, it, it seems like, how do they ever get anything made, you know? But just the acknowledgement that, like, there's something, there was something about the the book that you know people liked, and it wasn't just my grandma, yeah, right, <laughs> or my neighbor. So, so uh, yeah, that's out there, and I'm hoping that it uh, bears some kind of fruit. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, the new book, Mythian, which is the first book. Uh, in the Chronicles of Ethan, and uh, I th we were talking before we started recording, and um, I, I got about three quarters of the way through the book. 
Um, I'm going to finish it tonight, but man, um, this is lit RPG like I've not really seen before um, because it's, to me, um, it's like lit RPG meets cyberpunk in a way. Um, I've been a huge fan of cyberpunk, uh, you know, since I was a, a teenager, uh, basically, um, and really before cyberpunk was, was a thing. Um, but lit RPG kind of snuck up on me, um, you know, um, a, a few months back. Um, I, I didn't realize that there was such uh, an undercurrent in this kind of swell that was going on with lit RPG. And there's been so many great books come out in the genre that, I mean, the, the genre is really kind of forming and, and, and founding. Um, but I, I was really taken aback by the way you blended um, kind of the new stuff that's going on with lit RPG and this kind of old-ish, uh, not old, but uh, more established idea of kind of the man in the machine uh, kind of thing. Uh, where did where did the idea for this new series come from? Well, that's another one that kind of began in the past. So back in the late '90s, I believe, I started writing a story about a person who uh, retires from the real world and goes into um, kind of like a virtual world. All right, that was just like ours. Where everything's hooked up and controlled like uh, by a super powerful computer that could make everything seem real, you know? Uh, and, um, and then the matrix came out and I had never heard of the matrix. Uh, my thing was totally kind of in my head uh, that I came up with. And I remember the matrix came out and I said, damn it. Damn. Cause back then I just thought, I didn't think you could write what other people had already written. Um, you know, there's a million cop movies out there. It doesn't stop them. But for some reason, but for some reason, somebody makes the matrix and I can't finish my novel. And I think I was like really far down. I was like maybe three quarters of the way done. It was terrible. Of course, the book was terrible. So nobody would have ever kind of bought it or wanted to read it because I was too young. So, uh, but the, that idea stuck with me. And I always, I would tell people about it and they say, Oh, you should still write it. And I'm like, no, nah, cause of the matrix, and uh, but I'd always wanted to write that. So this book is sort of a mix of that book, as well as this new thing called Lit RPG. Um, and in my mind, they were very, very mutually compatible. So I was going to write a very character driven story, um, really, with all those emotions and the feelings and, um, you know, description uh, that goes on in my books um, with a lot less of the uh, maybe. You know, emphasis on swords and, and uh, attacks and battle and, uh, you know, all, all the kind of like uh, stuff that you maybe would have in a video game. Now, maybe that could, you know, maybe that's not going to go over well uh, you know, as the books continue to come out. But we'll see. I hope I hope that people want to read a little of that stuff or a good amount of that stuff, but also a lot of the character driven stuff. I mean, it's about a guy who goes into a virtual world, not because he wants to a game world. Uh, not because he wants to, but because he he finds out that his wife has been sort of resurrected in a cyberpunk kind of way, in inside of one of the game worlds run by uh, a corporation called Everlife, and they had talked about it. They were not going to ever do that. That they thought it was a big scam. You know, uh, your body is going to be left behind. Uh, it, it's basically suicide. Why would you do such a thing? But the way that the kind of in the future that the government sells it, that the corporation sells it uh, as a way of population control, quite honestly, this is all like in the first chapter. So he goes into this world looking for his wife and he's pretty single minded and, and he, you know, it's a it's a real human emotion kind of story. It's it's quite honestly a heartbreaking premise uh, from the beginning, you know, that's uh, uh it it really you know it it takes the the emotional kind of pardon the pun kick uh, <laughs> of of the Jenkins cycle and just exponentially kind of ramps that up. Um, and, and the book is fun. Don't don't get me wrong, but man, in the beginning, you really you really set the tone and set the stage with what's going to happen and with this character's emotional journey. I mean, Ethan, um, right from the beginning. 
you know, we we empathize with him. We want to go on this journey with him. Um, are you are you ever inspired by other like when you begin writing? Uh, are you ever inspired by music or uh, anything, any other mediums that kind of ratchet up the emotional um, connection? Um, well, sometimes I play music. Uh, usually I try to find music that uh, doesn't have any words um, or that I've heard so many times that I no longer think about the words. So I'll play like uh, the long side of uh, Hemispheres by Rush, you know, by Tour on the Snow Dog and all that other stuff on there. This it just goes on forever, you know. Um, but as far as inspired, like, uh, yeah, when I was writing some of the uh, the Jenkins books, I was uh, watching Justified. I think I was watching. Was that? No, no, that was the Thief book. So, I, yeah, but see, I got inspired by the way that uh, Elmore Leonard, uh, his writing was. Uh, I love Elmore Leonard, so watching it on the screen kind of, I remember just turning off an episode and rushing to write filled, filled with this excitement, um, about some of the, the, you know, ways that he handled mood or the, the director did, I guess. I think he wrote for like the first season. So yeah, I was, I was pretty inspired by that. Um, but a lot of times it's just books. Now uh, here's a, a perfect example of this, uh, that moody, dark, depressing, kind of beginning to a book, which just screams, you got to read it, right? Uh, I got that a little bit. I got the justification to do that from uh, Magic Kingdom for Sale, sold by T Terry Brooks, uh, because he writes a story about a guy who's lost his wife, and he is just at the bottom, bottom of the barrel, and then someone comes along and says, hey, you want to buy a Magic Kingdom? And he's so... He's so out of it. He says, "Yeah, what else do I got to lose?" Yeah. So in this one, this is there is a it's a different story. It's a guy. He says, "Hey, you know, gets a note saying, hey, your wife's alive in this game. You know, are you going to go and join the game?'" And uh, he's like, "Well, what do I got to lose?" So I was definitely inspired by by Terry Brooks for that. As far as the beginning, that first it was sort of like the the whole sort of plot of the story. Yeah. Uh, the overarching like reason why there's a book to begin with. I don't like, uh, I mean, if I can't, there's gotta be something at stake. There's gotta be something that almost life and death that matters so much that you, you want to write the book and people want to finish the book. Right. Right. Um, are you, uh, are you ever scared um, starting into a new genre? Like, uh, I mean, lit RPG, is, is a fairly new genre, and you've not written there before that I know of. Uh, and there's kind of this rabid fan base, you know, that's growing and growing and growing, and uh, you know that that kind of establish the rules and and what people are willing to accept and not accept. Um, is it scary jumping into new waters? First off, don't assume my genre. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was very it was very scary. Uh, Lit RPG community are very very vocal. Uh, they're just, uh, they're kind of wild bunch. It's, a, it's honestly the wild, wild west of, uh, literature right now. And which is you, fun <laughs> and scary. It's scary. It's, it's very, but at some point I said to myself, don't be scared. Just write. If you write truthfully, if you write from the heart, if you write something that just begs to be read, uh, you know, you're writing about people. It goes back to that cultural anthropology. Uh, you know, we're all different people in the world, but we're all motivated by the same things, love, fear, that kind of thing. And I'm giving that in these books. So hopefully it translates over. I have a, I know what the tropes are. There's a lot of tropes you got to follow in lit RPG. Um, you know, they want to see the dice rolls. They want to know that if you hit somebody with your sword, it doesn't just cut them. It causes a certain amount of damage. And they only have a certain amount of damage that they can take before they die. And death is handled in a number of different ways. In Lit RPG, there's true death, which means you're deleted, you go away, or you resurrect somewhere and you come back, um, respawning, just like a video game. So I was really heavily influenced by Ever EverQuest and uh, World of Warcraft, and before that, Dungeons and & Dragons and, and various 
uh, mind magic and you know all the different things either video game or or, or death, uh, tabletop so i've kind of steeped in all that already and i didn't even have to think about it to get into it um, so hopefully uh hopefully it translates well i seem to have gotten you know pretty good reviews so far um you know more more good reviews than bad that's the important thing and the people who don't maybe like the book so much uh maybe they want to see more of the, the what they call crunchy numbers where you have lots and lots of statistics and uh, math and uh, spreadsheets and uh, uh, really complicated like uh, class systems and stuff like that. Um, and the people who really like the books, um, they like the story more. They want to hear more about Ethan. Uh, you know, does he does he ever reach his wife? Things like that. Well, judging by the reviews, it's been uh, very well received uh, by the community. Um, I, I think it, it's really struck a chord with that uh, that readership. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I tend to be um, I tend to be more what do you call it critical? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean it was good? How that's not great. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is a question. Um, that I have about writing lit RPG. I, I've not written lit RPG. Um, I have written some sword and sorcery fantasy that that I've not published, but um, and and read tons and tons and tons. And a lot of lit RPG tends to resemble, um, you know, uh, epic fantasy or sword and sorcery fantasy. Um, but then we've got the the mechanics of it that are working. Does that make it harder? Yes. To write, knowing that that you have to track, you know, um, you can't just cast a spell and and the the land is rid of this, you know, dark plague. You, there are there's mathematical, you know, computations and all of this that have to be tracked. Um, as the writer, does that ever carry you out of the story, or does that become part of the story plot? It it's a really good question. It it does it dra it. It makes it very hard to write the story. It takes forever to just get to the next chapter because I can't go to the next chapter unless I know how many health points he has left, right? Because that's going to change how the next chapter is going to write. However, when lit RPG is at its most magical is when the actual stats and mechanics of the game are integral, integral to the plot um, in really clever ways. Uh, I can't give any examples of this without spoiling the books, but uh, you know, it's not, it's more than just, oh, you had a five and well, now it's a two. So you better just wait a while till it's a five again. And then, then you can go through that door over there and good luck with that door. You know, there, there's something terrible on the other side and he sometimes hits for five and then that'll make you a zero. And well, you don't want that. You know, that that's probably lit RPG at its most boring, but when the stats come together in a way that furthers the plot and the mechanics of the world, the rules of the world, uh, more than just the pluses and minuses, you know? Yeah. Well, w which leads me to, um, to ask, uh, did you plan out the series ahead of time and, and are you typically a, a planner or a, uh, a, a, a pantser or does it vary from project to project? I'm definitely, uh, more of a pantser, I guess, than a plotter, but I always plot a little bit. I always say, you know, I was, we all know where our stories begin, sort of. We should. Yeah. Uh, but I always want to know where it ends before I start writing. Even if it doesn't end the way I plan it to end, I want to have that self-assurance that at the end of the day, like, uh, some something happens. Uh, some specific set of things happen. And I won't write until I get that. And uh, I was, as I was said, I was reading uh, Sometimes the Magic Works by Terry Brooks. See, I told you it was going to come up a lot in this podcast. <laughs> and I was trying to do more plotting. So I did a really, as best I could, a rigorous plot of the Arch of Mythian. You know, and I had, it actually didn't end at all the way I had plotted it out. It is not the way I plotted it out. But it got me writing. It said, you have a, you have a future here. You, if you just stuck to the plot, you would have, you would have a book. Um, and that's probably the most I've ever plotted anything was Mythian. Um, and for the most part, I didn't stick to the plot. I, uh, I just sort of made it up as I went along like pantsing, but I did micro 
kind of outlining where I said, what's this chapter about? And I put those things at the top. Um, and as I started doing that fantasizing kind of thing, right, that's when things went absolutely crazy. And that was in book three. And, uh, and that's where all the magic, the interweaving of the mechanics of the world, the thing that kind of makes the world function, weaves directly into the, the actual story of the people. And it's very tragic. Um, I'll say this much. Okay. My vision of lit RPG of the world I created is probably different than a lot of, not all, but obviously a lot of writers in lit RPG. They look at it as a place maybe, Hey, I'd love to go to a world like that. Um, it's who doesn't want to go in a video game, right? Where I look at it is this is something like hell. You know, you go from a world like we have now with infinite possibilities into a world that's managed by mechanics <clears throat> where every day, is exactly like yesterday and it will be like that until the end of time. You know, you, you could theoretically, you know, do absolutely everything there is to do in the world, you know, and then that would be, that would just be hell. When you set out to write, um, the new series, um, the Chronicles of Ethan, uh, with Mythian as the first book, um, knowing that that's going to be a trilogy in the beginning, um, does that change the way the writing happens as opposed to the Jenkins cycle, which it, which was going to be a book that then became a trilogy? Yeah, it kind of did. Um, I wanted there to be three basic ideas for each book. Um, I wanted book one to be sort of you're introduced to the world. OK, um, it's sort of like you put the characters in the tree and the second book, you know, you set the tree on fire kind of thing. Uh uh, the second book was like uh, him getting powerful, him doing everything he can to reach his wife um, and all the the absolutely kind of heart wrenching things that are going to happen to him in book two. Um, and in, of course, in book three, uh, hero saves the day kind of thing. So I could have put all those into one book. Uh, I think uh, there's part of me that wonders if I should have. The books are sort of short. Um like 55,000 words for book one. I had this idea and I still kind of feel this way that I like the idea of reading shorter books. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's, uh, comes from reading like a lot of Robert B. Parker. I love how, uh, I love short books where things wrap up pretty quickly and you don't have to, you know, I don't like the big door stoppers, you know? Uh, but anyway, they, so yeah, uh, you know, I have 55,000 and 60,000 and 65,000 words for these three books. And uh, so I had to I had to write them in such a way that, you know, the, the readers didn't get a 25,000 word book and a 70,000 word book and a 40,000 word book. So they have to kind of even out a little bit. And so I had to pace myself a certain way. I don't believe in filler. If I believed in filler, they'd all be 80,000 words. You know, I like to I like to use uh, brevity. <laughs> And uh, not go on and on about uh, someone's shirt. <laughs> right. Well, I absolutely love what you're doing. Um, the The new series is called The Chronicles of Ethan. When we're recording this book, one is out. Um, second book is coming out around Thanksgiving, I think. And then the third book will come out in December. Um, John, I have to ask you, since that's wrapped up and, and you're launching these, uh, what are you writing on now? Can you give us any any insight? Uh, it's kind of funny. I'm reading, I'm writing a follow-up to the, 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 by the way, books one through three of Mythian are completed series. There's, you don't have to read them thinking, uh, why should I start this? You know, he's going to be one of those authors that doesn't finish the series. It is all done. You're going to get complete resolution to the entire series. If you stick around until December, uh, 20th to get the, the third book. Um, they all also launch with the audiobooks. They are, they're all going to have those day one of launch. But what I'm writing now is a kind of a spin-off um, of the series. Uh, it's um, about a different character, and there's going to be cameos from, like, you know, characters that you've seen before, that kind of thing. Love it. Love it. Uh, and at the beginning of the episode, we heard uh, an audiobook clip from uh, Mythian. And uh, go back and listen to that again, and then uh, click on the link in the show notes of this and go grab that audio uh, or the Kindle edition, whichever is your preference, from Amazon, and uh, and let John know what you think about it. Um, John, this has been so much fun talking. 
Uh, thanks for, for coming on. Uh, tell the people out there where they can find you and connect with you online. Um, if you go over to john-l-monk.com, that's right, I put the dashes in there. Uh, you can go to like about or contact or something at the top of the of the, like, of the website, and you'll see my email address. You can just email me. I'll, I'll answer you. I love to email people. So uh, have at it. Excellent. We're going to put links to all your stuff in the show notes. Uh, John, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show, buddy. I'm really happy. Uh, thank you for having me on. 